Testing. Oh, it works. Good morning, everyone. Feels a bit like the first day of school, doesn't it? <laughs> you welcome everyone in and um, suddenly the room goes quiet and all eyes are on you. So, um, good morning. Welcome to Australia, welcome to Canberra and welcome to the Pacific Island Program at GeoWeek. My name is Emma Luke and I'm part of the Geo Ministerial Summit Task Force. It is my great pleasure to facilitate our first event under the Pacific Island Program the high-level plenary Pacific panel discussion. A bit of a mouthful, I apologise. Let's just call it a conversation between people who are interested in supporting the Pacific. So, as many of you know, the Group on Earth Observations, or GEO, is seeking to increase its representation and engagement with the Pacific Islands. This is in recognition of the many ways the GEO community can use Earth observing in the region with many environment to meet it, many of its environmental and sustainable development challenges. However, to do this successfully, it's crucial for the geo community to assist the region coming from a position of understanding the governance, sustainability and technical challenges faced in the region. As we know, in terms of science for development, it is not enough to just have the best science products, they also have to be fit for purpose in the local context. Today we'll hear from a number of perspectives from the experts both in the region or those who have worked in the region for a long time on three areas of challenge and opportunity, governance, sustainability and technology. However, before we do this, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ms Vonda Malone, Mayor of the Torres Strait Island Council, to come and give us the acknowledgement to country. Thank you, uh, Emma. Deputy Dim and Kapo Migi Batainga. I'm from the Torres Strait Islands and um, I have been honoured to uh, start with the acknowledgement to country. Uh, I understand that you had a, the, the major welcome to country earlier on today. I really uh, thank the Ngunnawal and the Nambari people of this land in which we are gathering and respectfully acknowledge them and their ancestors and for allowing us to be on this this country and to do the business that we have to do this week. Our Indigenous elders and leaders have for years come to this place. Appropriately, traditionally, it's the meeting place. And for years, we carry our messages from across this country. I'm from the Torres Strait Islands, which is far, far north Queensland. It takes longer to get here than uh, most of our Australian citizens but for years, we have come to this place to put forward our, our, our plights about what we want uh, as for Indigenous people of this country. So I really uh, respectfully and humbly thank them for, for allowing us to be here, uh, for, for all the views from the various parts of Australia and from the world that come to share and to connect and to provide your knowledge as part of our week, it is an honour to be here and to represent also my people from the Torres Strait Islands of Far North Queensland. Esso and thank you. Thank you very much, Vonda. Vonda will be at some of our Pacific Island program events today and tomorrow, and I strongly encourage you to meet her to learn more about her, her role in the Torres Strait, Australia's sea country. Now I'd like to hand over to Ms Rosamond Bing, CEO of the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources of Tonga, to provide some opening remarks on behalf of Tonga, the first Pacific Island member of GEO. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, 
Good morning. Um, as introduced, my name is Rosamond Bing. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources in the Kingdom of Tonga. And I have the um, task of a centralized land registration, mapping, surveying, GIS, and um, natural resources um, mandate. So it's uh, quite a uh, wide ranging um, mandate. It is my pleasure to be delivering the opening remarks at today's panel discussion convened here at GEO Week 2019. Let me first extend my sincere appreciation to the Government of Australia through Geoscience Australia, the GEO Secretariat, and the multitude of partners for all the arrangements that has allowed us to gather here in Canberra this week. I note that one of the agenda items for the 16th plenary meeting of GEO is to consider mechanisms in which the regional GEO organizations can engage in more effective outreach initiatives in relation to the developing countries. I'm therefore pleased to share with you that the Kingdom of Tonga is now the newest member state to be granted membership of GEO. This was achieved through the advocacy of the GEO Asia Oceania, and I must acknowledge Dr. Stuart Minchin, the principal delegate for Australia, was influential in Tonga's membership. And also, congratulations, Stuart, a very good friend, on his appointment to the position of Director General of the Secretariat of the Pacific Community. And we look forward to working with you in your new role within the Pacific family. The Pacific region's commitments to achieving SDGs is guided by the Samoa pathway. The midterm review conducted this year recognized the need to identify new and concrete measures, initiatives, and partnerships at the local, national, and regional and global levels that have the potential to further progress SID's implementation of the sustainable development agendas. In this regard, the region continues to be supported by a number of funding partners, both on a bilateral and multilateral basis, as well as delivering implementation to the regional architecture, including the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, the Secretariat of the Pacific Community, and the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment Program. One of the key challenges for the Pacific region is the coordination of efforts in the monitoring and reporting of our SDG achievements. Also in the midterm review, there was a commitment to promoting initiatives that would enable better data generation, statistical analysis, knowledge management, education, communication, and outreach activities to support the effective monitoring and evaluation of the implementation of the Samoa pathway. Therefore, GEO plays an important role in making accessible those tools and resources to address this challenge, and therefore, GEO aligns with the Samoa pathway. One of the regional initiatives that I'm personally involved with is the Pacific Geospatial and Surveys Council, which is a regional body of professionals from the Pacific Island countries and territories. This is a role as chairperson that I've held for the past 18 months, and one of my primary roles is to oversee the implementation of the council's 10-year strategic plan. One of the strategies of this plan is harnessing partnerships with a view to enhancing the institutional resourcing and capacity capabilities of the council members so that data and information and advice is accessible to decision makers to enable them to make timely, sound, and well-informed decisions. Speaking from personal experience, Tonga was devastated within the span of three years with two Category 5 cyclones. Therefore, post-disaster and recovery demands such timely information and data. The PGSC Partnership Desk is hosted within SPC, and I acknowledge with appreciation the resources committed by SPC, which enables our council members to access a range of resources and capacity building activities that we would not otherwise have been able to access. In addition, the council has now signed two memorandum of understanding with our New Zealand and Australian counterparts, with Spatial Survey New Zealand, and with Surveying and Spatial Sciences Institute. This further strengthens our regional partnership. Shortly, I will be presenting at another meeting to present at the UNGGIM Asia Pacific Plenary Meeting on how Tonga is op oper operationalizing the integrated geospatial information framework through the development of a country action plan in strengthening geospatial information management. With our neighbor Fiji, we are embarking on an intensive national stakeholder consultation program with a view to developing a country action plan that addresses our particular country needs in the management of geospatial information. This project is funded by the United Nations Development Account Project and provides technical assistance and assessment templates 
but the groundwork is conducted by ourselves through a participatory process which ensures ownership of our issues and how to best address these gaps and challenges. And in March next year, Tonga will host the PGSC Council members at a peer-to-peer -peer learning event where Fiji and Tonga will share with our colleagues our experiences and our outcomes of the formulation of our country action plans. I therefore believe that today's thematic areas for the panel discussions on governance, sustainability and technology are key drivers to invigorate the Pacific region's push to take full advantage of the services, information and knowledge that the GEO community will make available. This is indeed the motivation that His Majesty's government had envisaged in its decision two weeks ago to accept the invitation for Tonga to join as a member of GEO. I wish you the very best in today's deliberations and I acknowledge the distinguished speakers whose presentations I'm confident will encourage and prompt constructive and lively discussions. I very much look forward to hearing the outcome of today's panel and discussions. Malo Abito and thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bing, and congratulations again on Tonga becoming part of the GEO family. We look forward to working with you. So I'd now like to invite Dr. Stuart Minchin, wearing two hats, to come up and um, give a little bit of scene setting on um, where we are now and where we could be in the Pacific. Oh, no, oh got it. We got it. All right. I won't put that up yet. Thank you, Emma. And thank you, everyone. Um, I'm not actually wearing two hats because I've got sunglasses on my head. <laughs> so um, for those of you that know me well, that's, uh, <laughs> this is part of my brand. Um, <laughs> let me explain uh, a couple of things. So back in April uh, 2018, when we decided to host the GEO community in the, uh, in the plenary and, and ministerial summit, um, I saw this as a unique opportunity for both the GEO community and the Pacific community to actually uh, work together. GEO I've been involved with for the last 10 years. Um, it's a fantastic community, but there is a missing piece in GEO, and that is the Pacific. Uh, GEO is very engaged across um, most other regions of the world, but the missing countries in GEO are in the Pacific. And there is huge opportunity for the Pacific to benefit from uh, the work that GEO does, but also for GEO to benefit from the Pacific's wisdom around how to, uh, how to work together, uh, the challenges that are faced, and, uh, and I see this as a unique opportunity for us to strengthen those, those bonds. Um, I had no idea at that time just how engaged with the Pacific I was about to become. So I'm really pleased that uh, that this has given me an opportunity um, that, that uh, subsequent to, to kicking off the process of, um, of designing this, this week um, to engage the Pacific, um, I, I applied for the role of uh, Director General of SPC and, uh, and as you've heard, I'm, I'm gonna be moving there in, in January. Um, so uh, for me, a lot of threads have come together over the last, uh, the last year or so. And I'm very excited that this is the first um, meeting that these two communities are really getting to, to exchange, um, exchange views and, and look at opportunities. Um, so uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to, to Canberra. I've been asked to talk about what could Earth observation in the Pacific uh, actually look like in the future. And I want to emphasise the word could, because we don't know. We haven't had the conversation yet. And we do need to have that conversation over the next uh, six to nine months uh, about what, what's needed in the Pacific. That can't be something that's thrown over the fence from, uh, from the geo community. Here, here, take this, this is what you need. But we actually have to have a conversation in the Pacific about what's required. Um, I've put some, th some thoughts up on the, uh, on the next slide. And I'm just gonna walk you through a few of the key points here that I think are important uh, as part of that conversation. But I wanna emphasize that this is just one view and that what we wanna do over the next uh, six to 12 months is actually have this conversation in the Pacific about what the Pacific really needs in Earth observations and then how the global geo community can help uh, support that. So um, first up, the heading, Digital Earth Pacific. 
uh, operational Earth observations. The reason I've put that up is, um, as many of you would be aware, we have a platform in Australia called Digital Earth Australia that we've developed, which is taking uh, Earth observations across Australia from the last 30 years of observations and turning that into decision-ready products that are being used by farmers, by uh, government departments, by environmentalists across the country to make decisions every day about how they look after uh, our country. Digital Earth Australia is operational. By that we mean that it's actually routine, it gets updated on a regular basis. People can rely on it being there. If I could use an analogy that I've probably overused, um, we can all get our weather report for any place in the, the world on our mobile phone every day and we expect to be able to do that, right? Anywhere we are, we can look up the weather. We don't, we're not expected to become meteorologists to make use of that information. We just get products that are useful to us. But we get them routinely, we can rely upon them. In the Earth observation community, we've not been in that position. We've had uh, wonderful data, but we haven't turned that data into products that people can actually use without detailed training and, and, and assessment. That's where we've got to be, that's what we're trying to do with Digital Earth Australia. And now, Digital Earth Africa, which we've kicked off, is doing the same thing for all of Africa. And I see the Pacific as the next logical step for this. Where are the needs that GEO is focused on? Climate change, um, sustainable development, and the Sendai framework. Uh, where are those coming to, to bear uh, most acutely? It's in the Pacific, right? So how can we work together to ensure that you, the Pacific has the tools that it needs to actually um, uh, utilise Earth observations to, to, to tackle those three key issues. So that's what I mean by operational and that's what I'd like to see in the Pacific. Routine services that actually tell you about how the corals bleaching, where there's coastal change, where climate change impacts are occurring, um, how marine water quality is progressing, where the water is on the land, uh, how the vegetation's changing. These are things that are tractable, that can be done routinely and be produced for every Pacific citizen. So I've just highlighted in the first dot point there uh, the, the issue um, which many of the Pacific will be aware of but that many of the geo community won't be and that is that um, in the Pacific we're dealing with large ocean states. These are not small island states. The small islands are only a small bit of the ter territory that each of these uh, nations looks after. It's actually a huge ocean area that uh, each country is responsible for. So a Digital Earth Pacific has to not just be about land observation, it has to be about ocean <coughs> observation as well and developing tools uh, to manage both the marine estate and the, um, and, and the land estate. Um, so I've listed a whole bunch of potential uh, use, use case areas that, that are there, but I've, I've included hydrodynamic modelling because I think any Digital Earth Pacific outcome has to actually uh, not just stop at observations, but actually uh, have those observations supporting operational modelling of the ocean currents, uh, sea surface temperatures and other things that are, um, that are so impactful in, in this region. The last dot point that I'm going to end on is that um, largely in, uh, in the case of Digital Earth Australia and Digital Earth Africa, we've um, relied upon the Landsat program, which has given us uh, regular data for the last 40 years, um, and more recently the Copernicus program, which is uh, free and open data sources um, that, that we've built those capabilities from. What I'd like to make the point on, though, for the Pacific is that um, in the Asia Oceania geo community, uh, which has been meeting over the last couple of days, there's very strong interest and support from some of our Asia Oceania uh, countries to actually provide data for the Pacific. And there'll be some announcements around some of this over the, the next week. But um, we have Korea uh, has, has great capabilities through CompSat, the uh, high resolution uh, optical data um, that, that I'd like to see uh, made available for the Pacific to, to build into this capability. We've got Japan with ALOS uh, radar information, which is really important for the, um, 
uh, the cloud affected islands uh, in the Pacific and uh, China with, with a, a whole series of satellites effectively who, uh, which can also provide extra outcomes. So I'd like to see the Pacific be the first place where we have an operational platform that does not just rely on Landsat and Copernicus, but actually brings all of the capabilities that are available for the region together to provide the best available uh, Earth observation platform we can to support those challenges in the Pacific. So that's what I think, but like I said, um, let's actually discover what the Pacific thinks over the next six to nine months and, um, and hopefully help them meet those needs. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Dr Minchin, um, who is a great visionary and I think will do, bring lots of great things in his new role in the Pacific. Um, and I might just use this moment to um, promote tomorrow's Talanoa Tuesday. So we would really love everyone to participate in this event. It will be held in the Pacific Island Room upstairs. This is an event that's co-led by SPC and SPREP and it will be exploring how best the geo community can engage with the Pacific to deliver on a vision that's going to help the region. So now I'd like to invite um, my first panel to come and take a seat um, up at the table. And uh, so I'd like to um, take a moment while our panellists are actually um, inviting themselves up to um, the seats to tell you about how the next bit is going to run. So what we're going to do is each panel member will in turn provide five minutes of remarks from their perspective, given their expertise. To ensure that everyone gets equal airtime, we have timers counting down the three minute, two minute and one minute mark. Now I know that we've got a lot of value to add today and I know that all of us are going to get quite enthusiastic and passionate. Um, but. We do have lots of other opportunities informally and formally to carry conversations over through the week. So um, I will ask that we just stick to the five minute rule um, in respect for all, all the speakers. Yeah. Have we got Vonda, Vonda on the stage as well? Now, one of the things I'd like to just flag for those who are a little bit of a complete introvert like me and are terrified with the idea of public speaking and asking questions in a session such as this, we have Slido enabled. Um, and we have um, a very capable team um, from the Department of Industry and Geoscience Australia who are manning our Slido functions. So. If you would like to just get onto Slido on your mobile device, just Google Slido, it'll come up on the website. Um, and the code for this event is PIP Plenary. Um, so if you don't want to ask a question of the panelists or you want to just leave some food for thought, um, you're very welcome to do so as well. I will ask that um, you keep your comments constructive and respectful to everyone in the room um, so that we can actually take away that valuable input and use it um, to inform where our discussions lead throughout the week. Okay. So, do we need a microphone, Mr. Movic? Do you have your microphone? You have you have the choice. Um, I did. We talk from this. Yep, absolutely. Have we got the other microphone? Where did it? Oh, okay, great. I'd now like to invite uh, Mr. James Movic, um, who was the former Pacific Foreign Fisheries. Um, Director General and is the current uh, Fusion Centre Chair to provide some remarks. Here we go. Thank you very much, uh, Emma. And first, let me thank uh, GEO organisers for agreeing and the Australian organising uh, authorities also for incorporating into this, uh, uh, the 2019 GEO Week, uh, this 
opportunity for a Pacific Focus Week as well. I truly appreciate that. I'm going to talk a wee bit about what I see coming forward with a background that, that, that has come out of the fisheries sector primarily, where the use of satellite technology has been particularly important for us in terms of our fisheries, tuna fisheries management, and where I think some of the lessons that we have learned in the development of fisheries management in the tuna sector in the Pacific could be of use in this uh, sector as well. But this is an area in which I have had a great deal of interest and, and developing quite a degree of passion about, most of it which may be uninformed, and I hope that at the end of this pr process I'll, I'll be better informed. But one of the deep concerns I have in the Pacific region as we go forward is that we are very, very proud of our ancestry, the fact that our ancestors were truly navigators of wide ocean distances. And they could travel quite comfortably between small specks of atolls, islands, across vast amounts of ocean. And they were able to survive and live productively in these small island uh, communities, but also even in our big islands, where we're relatively small communities, were able to survive well with their environment. And that did uh, us very well. But we are entering a phase now of, of climate change where all too often in the villages I hear people saying, well, the weather's different now. We don't know when to do our planting. We don't know when to do our fishing. The signals are not there anymore. So our traditional folklore is no longer able, uh, the paradigms that we had developed very effectively to maintain our existence, our technology, our social systems in the islands are now being threatened, are being brought into a state of, of uncertainty. And it is clear to me anyway, at least my view is, that we've got to get our people more engaged in the sciences, in the hard sciences. I appreciate the fact that we do have quite a community of active GIS practitioners, and I look forward, to, I hope that I will be able to attend their meeting in Fiji at the end of this uh, November. This has been a very active community, but they're really involved around a very tightly circumscribed area of uh, responsibilities and activities. We've got a very active community of marine coast uh, resource uh, conservationists and resource uh, managers, and I commend the work that they have been doing. But what strikes me is that in, all, in the past few years that I've become more and more engaged in this issue, I've not been able to identify Pacific Islanders who are engaged in the physics of the oceans, in the chemistry of the oceans, in the geology, and the hydrodynamics that take place in the oceans. And it does seem to me that our people need to become engaged in these activities well also. If we are to truly understand the whole range of science and the whole range of scientific products out there, for us to even begin to identify what are the appropriate questions to ask, what are the appropriate issues that we really need to have addressed. Because quite frankly now, my view is that a lot of oceans policy in the region is done with a relative degree of ignorance. My call to all governments is that we establish national oceans policies. I commend those who have been able to do so to date. I commend Tonga for taking the step of joining GEO, recognizing the importance and the role that uh, Earth observation can play. But we do need to have a, a systematic framework of governance of policy to drive this process forward at the island levels. We need our leaders to be engaged, to understand the power, the beauty of, of a lot of this observation data that is now already being generated and that we don't even know about. And there will be a lot more in the future if, if my experience in yesterday's discussions on IUU fishing uh, were, were an example. It, it, there is so much that is developing in this area that can help the Pacific Island communities. But we do need good, good governance frameworks at the national level. And in my view also, we do need an integrated regional oceans management policy because every country have, has their own set of priorities, their interests, their opportunities. And there will possibly be conflicts between those. So we need to have a systematic regional approach to oceans management and policy in the region. Now, we've got the basis for this, but we need to develop these further. We need to take it beyond rhetoric and grand, you know, slogans on banners to something that is operationalized, that actually works and guides our way going forward. Now, in terms of developing the community of, of practitioners, we don't need hundreds, 
possibly only a small handful of people that we need in this area. But there should be a deliberate regional program supported by our international partners, international governments and, and service providers and agencies in this field to, to develop at least a cadre of regional uh, practitioners who can be trained and given work opportunities in this area so that we have Pacific Islanders that we can call on. Now, I'm not questioning the integrity of, of our partners from outside who come and give us advice and try to help us, nor am I questioning uh, or am I saying that us Pacific Islanders are the only ones who know what we need. But there is a degree of contextualization and sensitivity that can be brought to the process by the use of our people and, and given the opportunity. But it's also a sense of ownership and control. We have adopted a policy at the regional uh, level of, of the Blue Pacific, of working together as a collective region to control our destiny in the face of increased international pressures, threats, and competition. But if we don't even know what's happening within our oceans, if we don't even understand these phenomena that are going on, if we can't understand what other people are doing in our oceans that may affect our future access to, to natural resources and a whole range of other issues in our domain, then do we really control this blue planet? And that's the message that I have for our leaders. I call upon the community that we, we start to develop a cadre of our people to go forward, develop the institutional policy frameworks at both national and regional level so we can take advantage of the wonderful uh, technology and products, uh, the data that's available out there, and develop the products that truly meet our needs, that, that we understand uh, best meet our, our particular needs. Thank you all very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Movic. That was um, really insightful. Um, can I please call um, Kathy Klugman, uh, First Assistant Secretary, Office of the Pacific, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, to um, make a few comments? Off. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you sincerely to the organisers, and I'd like to add my voice um, to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the land on which uh, we meet today, the Ngunnawal people, and pass my respect uh, to leaders past, present and emerging. Uh, I'll just say a couple of points because I think uh, with these sessions they can easily be filled up with people speaking, but I think you, we have an audience here keen to interact. And the points that I'll make uh, fit very nicely um, alongside those that um, James has just made. It's almost as if we collaborated ahead of the panel. Um, from the Australian government's uh, uh, point of view, uh, I think everybody in this room will know that uh, the Pacific uh, and the countries of the Pacific Island Forum uh, absolute priority relationships for Australia's international foreign um, and security policy. Uh, it is, uh, uh, this priority has been underlined uh, very forcefully uh, by the Morrison government. Um, and uh, the government has set us quite an ambitious uh, set of tasks underneath what is called the Pacific Step Up to build on what are decades of Australia's collaboration with other partners in the Pacific, including uh, in the areas, in areas very relevant to the subject of our discussions today. So the points that I'd like to make and the ones that chime in well with James's points are, uh, are firstly um, that there is probably no shortage of um, offerings on the supply side in this area of increased uh, maritime and other domain awareness, awareness across the Pacific. The key point is making sure uh, that uh, the new technologies, uh, the new ways of thinking, uh, the most successful um, and innovative collaborations are moved forward in a way that's connected to Pacific governance systems and the regional organisations that we have built so painstakingly in the region across the last few decades. And it strikes me that that is precisely 
the approach that we're um, uh, that we're building in today's session and beyond. Uh, so there needs to be demand, not just supply. And secondly, when we're talking about governance, we need to keep coming back to remember remember. Um, uh, that no governance system uh, can be successful without a starting point, which is the sovereignty of Pacific Island country governments. It is for the democratically elected Pacific Island country governments to uh, ultimately to determine their own priorities, the areas that they want to collaborate in, what they want to do alone, and how they want to uh, prioritise the activities that they're undertaking. Now, that's not an idle point in any circumstances. That is a fundamental point about sovereignty. But it, it is a point that has some acute uh, consequences in Pacific Island countries because in, in some cases we're talking about governments that are, um, that are, 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 are small, um, and where prioritisation is absolutely uh, essential for impact. So those are the two central points that I would make. I would also, just um, to help illustrate and perhaps as a prompt for discussion um, at the end of this session, I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of um, uh, areas of uh, particular activity for Australia and Pacific Island Forum partners uh, in this area. One is, of course, uh, the work that we are doing with Pacific Island country partners to implement the Boy Declaration. Leaders got together uh, on Nauru last year and they made, uh, as the central outcome of their discussions, the declaration of uh, this regional security declaration that they're determined to implement, a broader concept of security as it's represented in the Boy Declaration. Now, declarations are good and they're points of uh, intent, but they need, uh, they need to be implemented and they need to be work programs that are set alongside Boy Declarations. And the, the structures of the Pacific Island Forum um, uh, uh, process has put in place some um, uh, forum officials committee structures to allow us to implement together the Boy Declaration. A key contribution that Australia is making um, uh, is the establishment of the Pacific Fusion Centre, so I'm very happy to talk about that in Q&A. Uh, relevant also is the very substantially upgraded of offering from, um, from Australia through our second generation Pacific Patrol Boat Program, which now has an aerial overhang capability, which again is adding to the supply of information. The Fusion Centre will help render that uh, broad information usable for Pacific Island governments. Um, uh, and this, these are processes that, have, that are moving forward with the, with the standing of the Pacific Island Forum as, as regional, true regional initiatives. I'm very happy to go into any of those initiatives in Q&A after this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cathy. Um, and we, uh, we are very interested. We've got lots of opportunities to chat over a tea biscuit about some of the great things that Australia is doing through stepping up. Uh, and I'd like to hand over for a New Caledonian perspective from Dr. Yves Lafoy. Um, so if you'd like to uh, take the microphone or join me at the lectern, I am very flexible. With <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Uh, good morning, everybody. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to join my, my colleagues to acknowledge the traditional honour of this land we are meeting on today and thank the representative to be here with us this morning. Thank you very much. I would also like uh, to thank the GEO Secretariat, especially uh, you, Emma, and Stuart for the remarkable organisation of that, of that event that will last for a week. Uh, if I may, I would like to give you a, a background of the, of the governments in the Pacific and then zoom in uh, to Earth's observation data and a key role for us uh, in the near future. So we're all aware that the Pacific is one of the most disaster-prone regions in the world. The Pacific faces long-standing challenges such as isolation, low 
or limited economic integration and vulnerability to economic and environmental shocks. So the Pacific Island needs to develop uh, the technical capacity of the institutions and the human resources. To reach this goal, we've been, we have benefited from uh, aid funding, uh, mostly of uh, official development assistance, ODA. From these external sources of funding, we have experienced issues such as uh, aid effectiveness, uh, lack of aid effectiveness and uh, ownership of projects, aid fragmentation, volatility and predictability and insufficient or inadequate capacity building on the long-term basis. From these experiences on the ground, we've learned a few lessons. With regard to aid effectiveness and uh, project ownership, we know that donor practices can sometimes serve foreign policy better than reception development priorities, and that Pacific Island governments and local communities have to be involved from the start to express the need for donor funding. In terms of capacity building, we've learned that training needs can only be met if all stakeholders are involved in designing and implementing the capacity development programs. We are living in a digital world now. Connectivity, a major stake for the region, has shown its capability to transform Pacific, Island, Pacific Islanders' lives by providing access to knowledge and also uh, opportunities and enabling leapfrog stages of development. Over the last three years, Pacific Island Forum leaders have endorsed a series of high-level political declarations, such as the Pacific Blue Identity, James was referring to that, the Boe Declaration on Regional Security, Cathy was mentioning that, and last August, the Kainaki II Declaration for Urgent Climate Change Action Now. Given this background, accessibility to uh, high quality, timely and comprehensive Earth observation data is critical. Openly available data and updated data are needed for decision makers to take the right policies and strategies for the region. We know that Earth observation data access could be a game changer for the Pacific, helping us to address key issues affecting our region, such as climate change mitigation and adaptation, disaster risk and loss mitigation, and meeting the United Nations SDG targets. We know, we remember that last year, a meeting, a CSIRO meeting held in Brisbane brought together Pacific Island representatives and Earth observation providers to identify the needs the, and challenges that the, the region is facing. From the outcome of this workshop, a um, plan of action was to be developed for a Pacific Earth Observation Data Platform to be set up. So I would like to, as a springboard for discussion, to raise four points here. Where are we now? Ensure follow-up on the implementation of the workshop in Brisbane and its outcomes. Identify an institution in charge of assessing needs, gaps, and support access to Earth observation data in our region. Clearly define the mandate of crop agencies, especially SPC, SPREB, and FFA, in terms of Earth observation awareness and coordination in the region. And ensure that, that Earth observation international support is aligned to Pacific Island Forum priorities and integrated under the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat work program. So those, two, those four points could be summed up in one objective for us this week, which is to secure a better future for the Pacific through more strategic cooperation with the geo community. I thank you all. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Lafoy. And uh, yes, certainly the uh, Brisbane workshop last year that was supported by France amongst others and led by CSIRO in partnership with GA was um, very instrumental in laying the foundation of um, the sorts of discussions that we can have this week. Um, now, I realise that I've put Vonda on the spot here, I think, by um, 
seeing her role in the Torres Strait as the mayor and thinking, well, you know, um, in the Torres Strait, uh, again, small islands, uh, small governments and big challenges. So um, it's up to you, Vonda, if you'd like to say a few words from your perspective in your role about the sorts of challenges that you have. Um, and, um, yeah, we're very happy to hear your views. Thank you, Emma, and um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, be here today and uh, present, um, I guess, a perspective on what happens in the Torres Strait. So I'm mindful that um, we are not part of the Pacific, but we do have very similar issues and um, challenges, uh, I guess, in relation to um, our communities that are on very isolated um, islands that stretch from the tip of Australia far, far north Queensland, all the way to our international border with Papua New Guinea. And I'm not sure if there's any delegates here from Papua New Guinea, but some of the things that um, I guess are going to be raised here would be um, affecting their, their, their people uh, in the Western Province area that, um, that surrounds um, and a close proximity to our islands. So the Torres Strait, obviously the other component of Indigenous people of this country, uh, we are seafaring people, we live on islands um, and very much our culture and our traditions stem from the sea. We, pro we are going through a process of sea claim as well, which is something that because our land and sea is who we are. Uh, so everything that happens in our sea country is very important to our livelihood and the way that we practice our traditions. In relation to the Torres Strait, um, so uh, there are local government authorities. I am a mayor that's been elected by my community through a local government process out of the 77 councils that are within Queensland. Torres Shire Council is one of the uh, northernest councils and it, it encompasses a, a very, uh, I guess, a new, unique part of Australia that a lot, of, a lot of Australians don't know it's even part of Australia. In relation to, um, I guess, our composition, um, we are very multicultural, but a very strong Torres Strait Islander population. And uh, further to the north, we have another local government, which is the Torres Strait Island Regional Council. Collective, collectively, we have, um, I guess, the local government, as well as we have, um, I guess, a local authority that um, is through the Commonwealth Department, um, us mayors and the Commonwealth of Statutory Authority, which is the Torres Strait Regional Authority, we come as a collective and sit and discuss what's important for our region. So in the governance, it's, um, yes, we do have Westminster structures, but then we also have, within traditions, like in the Pacific, we had our own COD system, which enabled decision-making. So the challenge is obviously ensuring that L-O-R-E, which is traditional law, and L-A-W has some sort of um, alliance to enable that we are still able to exercise our rights um, as Indigenous people from our country that have never been removed from our country. So in relation to, I guess, the challenges, and I, I'm, I'm really thankful that um, uh, the early speaker there, uh, James, mentioned about um, you know, through the changes of, of um, what's happening worldwide, cultural traditions are very much at stake. So our hunter-gatherers, um, um, you know, reading the patterns of the seasons is not how it, it is, was before. So in even for our livelihood to know when it's best to go and hunt for certain seafood, uh, that's challenged... Um, by the fact that it's ever-changing. And yes, climate change is definitely at our, for, at our forefront in relation to our discussions and, and advocacy um, at um, our regional level, at our state level, and at the federal level and internationally. So in relation to, um, I guess, making um, technologies uh, that uh, we are exposed to now uh, benefit monitoring um, what happens in our islands. Um, I know that I've been exposed initially through um, my role. I wear several hats, um, and one of them is with the Indigenous Reference Group. 
which sits um, with the Ministerial Forum for Northern Australia, looking at what's important for future of economic growth for Indigenous people in Northern Australia. And one of that was, um, I guess, getting um, an understanding of some of the tools. Now, 2014, we started on this um, approach around advocating about climate resilience uh, so that our communities were best equipped to understand what is happening with our uh, foreshores and um, through, um, particularly when it comes through seasons of the year, at the end of the year, um, which is our cyclone season, what, it, what impacts and how can we best prepare for that. We have had tools in the past, but I think is enabling those tools for everyday people so that they can also manage their communities as opposed to just at a government level. Because our people are challenged by access to technology. We're only just going through a process with Telstra and with NBN to even get connectivity in our remote communities within Australia. There's some communities that completely don't have that access. So how can we have tools that we would enable where we want to check something on our phone that's accessible for the everyday person and it empowers them to understand and best manage and plan for that. Because we've had monitoring mechanisms over the years, but it's kept with the scientists. It's kept with the universities. Um, it's not accessible. And so how do you digest that and make that an enabler and an empowerer for us because it's our lives, it's our communities, it's our families, it's our children that are state, at state. So um, the filtering down. Um, and that's one of the things that we have been challenged as leaders. How can we get those messages more um, accessible? And um, with technology today, uh, you know, it is, it is providing the everyday person with that information on their phone or device. Yes, I mentioned about connectivity, and yes, it's, a, it's one of the biggest barriers, and it's still for a lot of Indigenous people that we are far behind in, in being part of the digital transformation, even to be part of, of what's happening worldwide. So I guess I just wanted to share that with you um, and say that um, you know, we, do, we do have, um, I guess, mainstream um, structures, but we're looking at how it actually works for our communities to meet the needs of our communities that are challenged. Uh, be, being remote, being isolated, being on islands and being in a part of Australia that, um, that um, not many people know about. So I wanted to share that with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Vonda. Well, for a surprise presentation, that was fantastic. And you've hit on a number of the key issues that the GEO community is exploring, both in the Pacific and other areas of the world. Um, so thank you again for that. Um, I'd like to now just move to Melissa Finney-Kane from the East West Centre in Honolulu. Thank you, Emma. Uh, let me add my acknowledgement uh, to the traditional owners and the past, present and emerging leaders. Uh, of this country, and also to the Geo Secretariat uh, for the invitation to participate. I bring the uh, perspective of a humble social scientist, um, seasoned but humble, uh, more humble as I <laughs> do more and more work in this region. Um, what I know from my work uh, is that this is a very active region uh, with a very long history of assessing and addressing climate impacts in many different ways through many different programs, initiatives, uh, traditional responses uh, and networks. Um, and it's certainly not a one-size-fits-all region, uh, as you can see just uh, by the conversation that we've had so far, diverse cultures, languages, laws and laws, uh, capacities, needs, even topography of different islands. Um, I mean that we need to be really aware of the local nuances of how we utilize climate observations uh, in other Earth observations. I think what this means uh, is that there's a real need for uh, ongoing collaboration and leveraging to make a little go a long way. There's also a need to sustain and expand the observational systems that we have, rainfall and streamflow monitoring, for instance, uh, and many other um, monitoring programs. 
Uh, there's also a need for integration of climate information with other information, uh, whether that's other natural and physical science, uh, such as groundwater models, demographic information, population projections, economic um, information, uh, and governance and uh, legal contexts and cultural contexts in which this information is being used, so that we can really address the real world problems that decision makers uh, such as Vonda are trying to um, deal with that in a way that's sensitive to the local context. So it's great to have all these data and products, but if they're not designed from the outset to be relevant, accessible, credible, and legitimate in that local context, uh, then we're not doing our job. Uh, since the one minute sign hasn't come up yet, I'm gonna give a, a very quick example of um, one way that we've had physical and social scientists working together with local communities uh, from the perspective of um, US affiliated islands is the Pacific ENSO Applications and Climate Center. Um, this case is documented in a publication that recently came out uh, from the East West Center. You can also find it online. Um, it's hard to, re to imagine now, but in the late 1980s, not many people knew about ENSO or El Nino, although many had experienced its impacts uh, in this region. Um, some of you may know Chip Gard was a, uh, um, joined the US National Weather Service uh, as a forecaster in Guam in the late 1980s. And uh, in the late, in the, just before the 1997-98 El Nino, he saw this pattern of warming in the oceans in the Eastern Pacific uh, and was alarmed enough to bring the information to governments around the US. Uh, affiliated islands, and as he says, talk eyeball to eyeball with people. Um, he met with government leaders, non-government organizations, whoever would listen, even religious groups at that time. Uh, and communicating the forecast made a really critical difference uh, compared with the 82-83 El Nino after the, or during the 97-98 El Nino, it seemed like there was uh, better preparation for the drought that ensued. Uh, in, most importantly, governments were able to issue emergency declarations in advance of the onset of drought, paving the way for delivery of water and food and other supplies in advance, uh, which is really important for especially atoll islands and other low-lying islands where they depend very heavily on rainfall for fresh water. But also keeping in mind the remoteness of many islands means that it's not a simple process to provide um, these supplies without some warning. Uh, so the development of, of uh, the PIAC uh, Center, now the PIAC Service, was not an accident. Uh, it's really developed after the 82-83 um, event through a request from uh, governments around the region to have uh, NOAA, National Weather Service, Un uh, University of Hawaii, University of Guam come together, uh, also the Pacific Basin um, Development Council, to develop tools and information that was relevant to address this problem. Uh, and now, uh, the for forecasting is so institutionalized that US embassies, uh, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, USAID, and Pacific Island governments actively seek the forecasts uh, to plan for seasons ahead. And earlier this year, PIAC was, um, became a fully a part of the National Weather Service as an operational entity. Um, they've had physical newsletters, quarterly newsletters for uh, many, many, well, for decades, uh, but now they have finally phased those out. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. Um, but I think the El Nino forecasting, the critical point here is it depends very much on monitoring a host of ocean and atmospheric variables as they develop and on using those observations to improve models over time. And so the success of PIAC has really been those observations being combined with sustained interaction to fully develop skill in the models. Um, and I think in the future, uh, continuing and improving the accessibility the relevance, the credibility, and the legitimacy of this information in local context will really depend on the sustained interactions uh, with local end users of the information. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Melissa Finney-Kane. Um, and uh, both Stephen here and I were saying that you may say you're a humble social scientist, but it's actually the social scientists that translate a lot of great science in the world and apply it to um, everyday contexts and do it in a way that makes it successful. So we think you're pretty important.
I'm now going to hand over to Mr Stephen Ramage from the Geo Secretariat, um, who's going to provide a few comments on um, things that have occurred to him um, in hearing the presentations. G'day. <laughs> so you can, you can probably hear I'm not Australian and I'm not from Pacific Islands, um, but I am uh, working internationally for Geo. Uh, and we hear a lot of uh, sim similar issues around the world. So all I want to do is just do two things. Firstly, just explain a bit of geo-governance, and then secondly, pick up on some of the points that the speakers raised. Um, but as an organiser, I would like to thank the speakers and the participants who have all thanked the organisers. So thank you very much and, and welcome. Um, the highest level of geo is the plenary and that's this week. It happens once a year, and that's where all the decisions are taken. So later on in the week, there will be hundreds of people representing their countries who will be in there talking about all the work of GEO. The executive committee is the organization made up of 16 countries that governs the work throughout the year. The GEO secretariat works with the executive committee and the program board who take care of the work program. So the work program is where the magic happens. The work program is now fixed for 2020 to 2022. It's 58 activities and five foundational tasks. So what that means is if you're working in agriculture, biodiversity, climate, disasters, energy, forestry, water, oceans, any of these areas, they're within the work program. So those are the places you go to learn about what's happening in GEO and to contribute. So in the work program that's just been published, every aspect of the work program has an implementation plan. So every one of those 58 activities has an implementation plan, which is on the website. So you can all go and find information about that. Um, to provide focus for all of this, we have what are called engagement priorities. And engagement priorities are around policy instruments. So those policy instruments are the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, and the Paris Climate Agreement. We're also working on some emerging areas, um, such as the new urban agenda, which is looking at SDG 11 and the work in cities. But we also look at policy um, activities through other parts of the work program. So the HE targets, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Minamata Convention, those are also covered by work program activities. So in terms of what the speakers said, um, if I just go through chronologically, James talked about signals not being there bef before and the science of the oceans. That's really where GEO can help because we have people, I mean, the, this, the, the Earth observations can help provide those updated signals. Um, and also the science is what a lot of the community is working on. Um, the systematic process of policy and governance, we have activities in the oceans through UNESCO IOC, through GOOSE, and through GeoBlue Planet, and many others, POGO and, and others. So what I'm, I'm, what I'm saying from a governance perspective is I'd really encourage you to look at these different activities in the work program. In terms of Cathy and what she said, she talked about systems being connected to government structure and sovereignty being important. So everyone sits at the table in GEO representing their country, but they're there for this um, shared voice. Um, I was reading something earlier this week about the age of collective genius. That's what this has been described as now, this period we're in. And I would say that that's what happens in GEO. Maybe not all geniuses, but we certainly get the brain power of everyone thinking together, and it makes a big difference. Um, then Eve was talking about fragmentation of projects and long-term capacity building. So we've, we've changed a little bit the way that GEO has been doing capacity building, and we've, we talk about building on capacity, because there's already capacity in places. It might be limited, but we want to build on what's there. And we don't want to come in and do training and leave again. What we want to do is co-design and co-production. So, so we've changed it to capacity development, and we've been working with ITC in the Netherlands who've been developing this with the existing team that have been working on capacity development for the last five, 10 years in GEO. And then Vonda talked about um, multicultural composition. For me, that is geo. 
Geo is made up of, of all sorts of people from all sorts of countries and places and all sorts of disciplines. So it really is uh, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary. She also brought up the, the, I think it was the first time I heard the word indigenous. And we've been running, uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've been running a, a hackathon, an indigenous hackathon across five or six countries. And that's been to bring together youth in communities um, with technology guided by elders. So that finished last night, and that's been looking at bringing sort of traditional approaches with state-of-the-art technology. So we, that, that's, that's been working on it. Uh, one of the things I saw last night when I went across was um, they were taking some of the outputs from Digital Earth Australia and looking at coastline monitoring and bringing in local information about edible food and putting the two things together. So that's very powerful to be able to do that. And looking at what levels of privacy for sharing that information is important to the, the local community. And then finally, Melissa talked about um, traditional responses and networks. Quite often I describe GEO as a network of networks because we are able to cross. If you think about something like the water food energy nexus, then we have GeoGlam looking at agriculture and food security. We have GeoGlows and AquaWatch looking at water. We have GeoVeneer looking at energy. And we sit across all of those areas, so we're able to bring these different disparate communities together, these networks together. So I think that's a big thing that Geo adds. And then finally, um, she talked about information integration. And what you will hopefully see throughout the week is across the side events and in the plenary itself, that we talk about how the work program and the work of GEO writ large covers that approach. So we're working across multiple different communities to look at how do we look at statistical information with Earth observations, how do we look at cold data records, how do we look at all these different types of information that can be supported or enhanced with Earth observations. And I beat the pink slip. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I definitely, if you've got a chance to talk to Stephen, um, I would fully recommend it. Uh, you never know where a conversation might go. Might be signed up to GEO. Um, in the interest of trying to keep time, I'm going to ask for just two questions for this session. Um, and wearing another hat of mine, I'm all about gender diversity, so I'd like to um, take one question from a gentleman and one from a lady. So do we have our first question? Please raise your hand. Or use Slido. <laughs> no questions? Perhaps. Uh, oh, we've got a question up here, please. Thank you. I think that's a, a great point, uh, and thank you for the question. I think that you're absolutely right, uh, and it's not just the ENSO for or the El Nino forecast, but many other situations where there are different assumptions going into different models, coming out with different um, recommendations or, or information for different users. Uh, one way I think that we can um, move 
uh, through that or help to facilitate conversations and decision making is to have more uh, conversations and dialogues where uh, you know it, it's a, a convening role of a place like the East West Centre to bring together these different uh, efforts and either come up with a set of guiding principles or guidelines or at least encourage or improve, facilitate understanding about why there are differences. Uh, in my own work, uh, one of the challenges uh, in the, the islands has been the different um, forecasts for, or projections from dynamic versus statistical downscaling. And uh, for a variety of social, political, I'm a psychologist by training, uh, and, and other cultural, scientific cultural reasons, it's been hard to have conversations between those types of scientists about why those differences occur. And it ends up being very confusing for the users of, of that information. But over time, through sustained interaction and engagement, we have bridged that gap. And I think it's the same situation where we're, we're really trying to first identify the gaps and then figure out ways to bridge those gaps so that that information with all its you know, uncertainties and different assumptions that go into it, uh, can be better understood and utilized. And part of that is uh, the role of trusted institutions in helping have those conversations and being reliable places for that information to come out. Thank you very much. So um, Emma, can I just oh, answer yeah. from a geo perspective? Um, Absolutely. So, so, so that's exactly what geo does. Um, GeoGlam, Global Agricultural Monitoring, there's a monthly crop monitor and there's over 100 partners. It includes WFP, FAO, they're all in there. GeoBond, over 500 partners that are working on essential biodiversity variables. UNDP, uh, NASA, they're all in there. Uh, EO for SDG, Earth Observations for Sustainable Development Goals. For each of the indicators that are being developed, we've worked with the custodian agencies. So UN Environment for 661, as an example, bringing all the different players together in a community. So that's kind of the modus operandi of, of GEO. Um, your explicit example, I don't know so much about, but that's kind of what we're trying to achieve in GEO. Fantastic. So um, I'm actually going to take, uh, there's a very good question to, on Slido for both James and Kathy um, from the audience. What is your advice for suppliers to ensure they don't avoid bypassing regional, existing regional governance arrangements or Pacific Island priorities? As I said, I think you work through governments and existing structures. That's how you do it. Uh, you don't set up a separate coordination mechanism because the effect of separate coordination mechanisms, mechanisms is uncoordination. Yeah, I, I would echo what Cathy just said. And, and people need to keep in mind that the reason that the Pacific region has been able to be as effective, the individual Pacific Island countries, and collectively as a group, is that we have worked on a regional unified basis to the fullest extent possible. And so sometimes uh, unilateral efforts come in that could undermine uh, these regional processes. So in the first instance, it is important to always look where we can support the regional processes. Now, for those who may be concerned that at the regional or national government level, the needs of communities may not be getting addressed and incorporated, well, that's a process for national uh, consultation and, and governance. And increasingly, governments are uh, engaging with their community sectors. So it, it is, uh, we are serving the interests of all of the people. But for outsiders wanting to come in, I strongly urge that you deal with us as a region and understand that that's the way that we prefer to deal also. Well. Thank you very much to panel one. Um, we're running a little bit over time, which I expected because we're all passionate, we've all got good things to say. So if I can invite panel two to come on up. And um, if you haven't joined Slido, please do so because um, we're getting some great comments through Slido already. And it's another good way of collecting important comments and opinions. Yeah, yeah, it's warmth, warmth, mate. Just go, just go for a Fiji.
Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, hand over to Dr. Andrew Jones as the Director of the Geoscience, Energy and Maritime Division, Secretariat of the Pacific Community, um, to say a few words. Okay, thanks very much. Nisan Bulo of Anaka and good morning, everyone. Um, I've only worked and lived in the Pacific for a few years, so I don't actually feel qualified to talk about sustainability. Uh, but some of my team are Pacific Islanders who've been working on technical projects for more than 20 years, so I did ask them about this before I came over. Anything that makes sense comes from them. Anything that doesn't sound right is my misinterpretation. Um, building on what was, some of what was said in the past session, uh, I just want to put some numbers on it just to give you a bit of context, and, and I'll read these so I don't get them right. Um, the World Bank Index of, of GDP by country shows that the six countries with the lowest GDP in the world and nine of the bottom 12 are Pacific Island countries and territories. So these are vulnerable um, countries to national disasters and climate change. Their ability to respond is, is very, very limited. Um, if you look at the 10 countries in the world with the smallest populations, half of them are Pacific Island countries and territories. So while Stuart wears two hats in series, people like Maisien um, and other national government representatives, they wear five or six hats in parallel. Um, because there are just so few people running a government and a country in, in the same way that Australia and New Zealand need to. And final point, um, in terms of context, uh, the World Bank tells us that official development assistance is equivalent to, on average, 50% of central government revenue in Pacific Island small states. So, so much funding comes to these countries in the form of official development assistance. So in terms of sustainability, that brings two things. Firstly, that Pacific Island countries and territories have such limited human resources within their governments. And oftentimes, projects coming from outside can actually add strain on that. Um, Pacific Island government territories don't feel like they're in a position to say no, but often when we take people out to train them, they're not doing their day job, and they come back and they have to catch up. So unless it's directly relevant to what they do every day, we're not helping these people. The second point is that because so much money comes into the country through official development assistance, is that it tends to be highly projectized. And so what we see is projects come in, they come in for three years, four years, six years, and then they go again. And in terms of technical projects, they often might fund the acquisition of a bit of data, but data's a living thing, and the maintenance of that data it does not get done. And so my team was saying they've worked on wonderful projects in the past, collected a wealth of incredibly good data, once a project's done, it gets put in a box and we never see it again. So I was asked to be, in the speaker's notes said to be constructive. Not much of what I said is all that constructive up to this point. Um, but one <laughs> quick example on where things have worked really well, and that's the Pacific Sea Level Rise Monitoring Project. That's a project that's been running for 30, almost 30 years in tech, collecting good technical data across the Pacific. And the reason it's been so good for so long is because it's been a great partnership between SPC, the Bureau of Meteorology, and Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade out of Australia. So what the Pacific doesn't need is a whole bunch of money coming in through a whole bunch of little projects. What we need is great partnerships. And when that extra funding comes in from outside through a really good, established, trusted partnership, that's when we make sustainable gains to the Pacific. Okay, thanks. Terrific, thank you very much um, for those remarks, Andrew, and for your team, they're on point. Um, Tamara, can I hand over to you now? So I feel a little bit like you just um, shared, no, 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 it's good, it's good. A lot of your points are exactly where I was headed. Um, first of all, I'd also like to join my um, peers in, in being grateful to Gio, to Emma, um, and recognizing the land on which we um, have this space to share knowledge from the indigenous peoples of this area. So gratitude and thank you. Um, so just, I, I think I come from this from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I would like to just share an antidote a little bit about a history, my history um, in the Micronesia and how that may relate to the sustainability and, and the way projects can be beneficial, um, accenting all of the points already made. So about 20 years ago, um, I was this little Canadian girl who was put on the uh, about 500 miles away from the capital of the, the um, in the Marshall Islands in Majuro Atoll. I was the only non-Marshallese person. Um, I was a teacher and every day I would go to class and 
and I would share what I was supposed to share, um, teaching English, being that person. Um, and I started to notice that my kids and, and the reality that I was trying to share with them was very different than the reality in which they, they lived their lives. And we suffered a three-month drought while I was on an outer island. And the kids were coming to class and they were learning all these things. Trying, I was trying to teach them all these things. But in reality, they weren't able to shower in the morning because there was literally no water. They weren't able to eat because the times, the, the, the breadfruit and the pandanus was, was uh, dried up. Uh, their families weren't able to catch fish because the sea, sea level rise and, and extended storms meant that traditional knowledge was changing. And these are six-year-old kids who were already understanding this. I like to think they say everything you learn, you learned in kindergarten. Everything I learned about my time in Micronesia and this conversation, I think I learned from kindergartners um, on the outer islands of the Marshall Islands. Um, and I think it became an ethical responsibility. This, this recognition was in, what became of, of their reality and what I was trying to do that sort of seemed unimportant. Um, and it was my ethical responsibility to start to learn the science and start to understand and maybe share that with the kids to empower and to allow these kids to have a choice in the matter to allow these kids to, to understand the traditional means and the, the, the change of their, real, their daily reality, but also perhaps pursue educations outside of this small island that enabled them to, to as my, my peer um, James shared, there's a lot of capacity, but there's not a lot of recognition, I think, of this whole area, of what a student might who, who, pursue, who, who has an interest in mathematics or has an interest in mapping or has an interest in, 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 in food security or what have you and how they may pursue education that would allow them to become many of you. So I think that, that was, um, that's just really important and, and I think it's important that we inspire this learning. And so therefore, when I think about international donors and science and what have you, I, I go back to that all the time. I just want to fast forward to what happened. I ended up um, working now. I work for an organization called the Micronesia Conservation Trust. We're a sub-regional organization. Uh, we work in the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, Palau, the CNMI, and Guam. And what we do is sort of, it's like a microcosm of what I think this whole conversation is around. We garner donor funds, international funds. We find scientists. We bring teams. We work in communities, and then we subgrant or we ensure that that science is then translated. I think one of the big problems with sustainability, which is what I've been asked to talk about, is that a lot of the times groups, um, projects come, and we've all touched on this, ad hoc, or people doing masters and PhDs, they come, they gather information, and they don't come back. Um, and, and so Micronesia Conservation Trust, we tried to sort of hone, hone in a little bit of that. But one positive example of sustainability is, and I think the governance panel spoke a little bit about the importance of playing in or being part of already established mechanisms. So we have something in Micronesia called the Micronesia Challenge. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. In 2006, the chief executives and the presidents and, and um, uh, governors of the five entities of, of the jurisdictions we represent decided to challenge the world to effectively conserve 30% of their marine, coastal marine resources and 20% of their terrestrial resources by 2020. But under that came a lot of important indicators. We had to create indicators under terrestrial conservation, under marine conservation, and very, very importantly for the people of Micronesia, the socioeconomic indicators. So we're developing protected areas, we're doing delineation, and, and this is all coming, it's, it's an interesting um, and very useful and I think very successful story of all the way from the presidents, from the governance, all the way down to the communities. Um, and I think it deals very much with, the, I, I think all of this, it's important for us to remember, is about human beings. And it's about human beings' ability to survive and, and be resilient and still have livelihoods and still be a part of, you know, have their tradition but also embrace modern technology and where we can um, bring those things together. So just really quickly, I think, again, everyone touched very much on a lot of the thoughts I had. As somebody who um, runs a lot of projects and coordinates a lot of different entities, 
I think one thing that's really important, probably most import important, is for a project to be sustainable, it needs to have commitment, collaboration, and trust. So, and we've talked a lot about that already. It's important that when organizations, um, especially in areas like geo that is a little bit uh, not translated as much yet, it's important that people acknowledge um, and, and are, are that the awareness activities go on, that, that, that the people in the communities are part of it. Uh, to establish that trust is extremely important. I think number two that's really, really, really vital is the capacity development. Recognizing that a lot of these expertise are long-term, these are bachelor's, master's, PhDs, long-term training. We can't just come, you can't just come to Micronesia and teach a lot of the work that you do. Um, but engaging and coming back and inspiring kids to understand that they could be you too. Um, and then the whole donor-driven idea, I think we've also talked a bit about that. I think it's really important that we listen. Um, there's a lot going on already. We have a lot going on. Uh, some of my peers who are with me now, um, we talked about this last night. Sometimes people come and they, they conduct research and the community say, we already told people that because somebody's come or a group's come and they've conducted the research and taken the research away and then people in the FSM want the information so we have to go and do it again. So collaboration is a big part of it. Um, and I think accessibility, ensuring that the work is accessible. So in the end, it's the users at the end. How can they access what we have to offer? How can it better their lives? Um, and to remember to work closely with people, and I think to empower. And I know this all sounds somewhat maybe cliche, but it's really, really important when you're working with people whose, whose livelihoods and day, every day, people in the Pacific and certainly in Micronesia where I live, every day their lives are affected by these things. It permeates life. So I think it's important to ensure that the tools that we have um, can set people up to survive, not just survive but thrive. I think um, you've probably heard that before. That's, we have a, some very special uh, Micronesian poets and activists who have been traveling the world and sharing, but I think that's the bottom line of the message. Sustainability means impacting human beings um, in a way that they can survive and that they can thrive. Thank you very much. Tamara, I'd like to keep moving along. Mark Alcock, you're next. Okay, thank you. Um, Oh, well, uh, many of the things that I had in mind to say, I think, have, have been said. But, uh, but, I, but I think one of the things that I, I would say, of course, is that, um, well, I think that over the years of being involved with the Pacific, most of the, the lessons I've learned are by making uh, mistakes. And, uh, and, and my very first uh, exposure to the issues of the Pacific. I was uh, at, a, at, a, at a meeting in Tokyo on a totally unrelated, unrelated event where I was pushed in to convene a session on the issues of the Pacific with no background in this area. And someone sat down on the bus next to me on the conference and said, Mark, you need to do more for the Pacific in the, this area of maritime boundaries that you work in. And I turned to her and I said, why is that my problem? And um, and I can do that with our technical uh, team in, in six months. And then later on, I became responsible for that program. And I realised that my predecessors had tried to do, using a technical approach, the same thing on a number of occasions, and it had gone nowhere. And the reason it had gone nowhere is because if you're going to work with the Pacific, you have to realise that um, it's about people, and often the people are at least as capable as you are, and often they are smarter than you are, they just have not had the opportunities uh, that, that you have had, uh, and, and they have greater barriers to do their work uh, than, than, than you, you have been fortunate to, to have. Uh, and I was fortunate to have that exposed to me. It was one of my first meetings uh, which, uh, where, we, where we got the people to the, from the Pacific there. Uh, and it was quite a humbling experience because, of course, you go in thinking you have all of the answers. And, and in fact, uh, it was just the start of a journey in, in, uh, in learning. Uh, and I think with that, the, the issue that's being touched on that is really important is the value of the regional agencies because they can stop you 
making many mistakes in engaging with the communities. They understand the people and they have the time and the continuity of engagement that you do not have from out of the region. So they can, if you come from out of the region, so they can make a real difference to the quality of the program uh, that you you deliver. And, and I can, and, and, and seeing the mistake that not doing that can have, I, I was at a, a, at a meeting that another state outside of the region had organised in completely good faith, and just because they use their own social norms to organise the dinner, they offended everybody that attended that meeting because they didn't understand the, 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 the region. Now, I can't say that I would necessarily understand the region any better, but I look to the guidance of those uh, that, that do. Uh, now, another point I'd, I'd, raise, I'd like to raise, which has been um, raised before, but competition between donors is a disaster. Uh, one of the things for, that was important for us in the program that we delivered uh, in the maritime boundary space was to get all of the donors together and agree what we were going to do and what the messages we were going to deliver and seeing how the different funding rules would allow us to fill in the gaps that we, we couldn't do. Uh, and that, was, that, that has been critical to, to giving space, to, to not causing confusion uh, to the people that we're supposed to be... Uh, uh, assisting, but also has allowed us to ride over the unevenness of uh, the funding um, the funding cycles, where sometimes we end up with each each individual donor will have breaks of six months or a year, which could be a disaster for for the program, and, and someone else can step in and work together uh, to to that goal. And I think since uh, there's just one more minute left, the only other thing I'd say is, as has been mentioned, if you're going to work in this region, you have to be there for the long term. You have to be uh, resilient, but it can be a lot of fun. So, yes. Thank you very much, Mark. And um, certainly your comment about working through um, donors together collaborating, not competing, is um, we have a real opportunity to do that through GEO um, and that will help us provide more strategic to support to the region. So I'm just going to um, pass over to Stephen in one moment for any remarks he might like to make. Yep. Okay. Hi, I'm still Stephen. Uh, okay, so in terms of sustainability, within GEO, we, the sustainability part comes from what GEO has been doing for over a decade, but we have specific activities that have the word sustainability in them. So there's EO for SDG, which is looking at uh, sustainable development goals. We also have other activities like GOLDN, land degradation neutrality. We have stuff looking at plastics in the ocean. We have other things that are all about sustainability, um, but might not explicitly say sustainability in, in what they're doing. I want to go back to what Vonda talked about. Vonda talked about um, connectivity issues, and that's something that we see parallels with in Africa and Latin America and other regions. So that's not a new topic for GEO. It's not necessarily explicitly something GEO does, but it's something that the countries are working on. So that might provide some ideas on how they've gone to their governments and providers to try and get help with connectivity. Um, Andrew talked about vulnerable countries. Um, I, there's a couple of things that are going on in GEO right now. There's something with the uh, International Science Council, and there's also work with UNDRR, the United Nations body responsible for disaster risk reduction. Uh, around the Sendai framework, and that's looking at, um, at resilience, looking at vulnerability. So there, there's a activity underway there. There's, uh, he talked about the, the strain of external projects, and I think that's something that everyone experiences. Um, I don't know if it's a useful idea, but there are huge volunteer communities within GEO, not just GEO themselves, but we work with the Humanitarian Open Street Map team, we work with the Open Geospatial Consortium, we work with the Red Cross. So again, that network of networks I was talking about can open doors into other communities that can help, that have expertise in some of these areas. Um, another suggestion would be to work with us on some of the long-term capacity development 
So that work is emerging now. We've, we've recalibrated and we're doing that again. So that would be very useful. And then he talked about needing trusted partnerships. And I think, for me, that's what GEO is. GEO is the platform for trusted partnerships. The good thing about GEO is when you sit at the table at GEO, you're talking about challenges and opportunities, and it's countries talking to countries. The other organizations that come in, the associates, the participating organizations, anyone else, whether it's non-governmental organizations, civil society organizations, they're all there to help the countries. So it's a trusted environment, and I think that's really, really important to get that across to everyone. Um, Tamara talked about a uh, lack of resources such as water through her stories. Uh, what, one example of, from the work program and the, in the ministerial summit at the end of the week, the minister from Uganda will talk through this. And this is from uh, the global agricultural monitoring work. So through the crop monitoring work in GeoGlam, we've also been doing early warning activities. And through that work, we were able to predict drought that would be in Uganda in a place called Karamoja in 2017. And as a result of that work, we were able to say that 32,000 households were going to be impacted, which was 150,000 people. So we were able to plan ahead and make sure that people were able to move from where they were to plan for food, to plan for jobs. And, and we, that meant we didn't have to trigger the disaster risk financing from the World Bank, which saved just under $3 million. So being able to use Earth observations to plan ahead for things like water resources management is really important. Um, she also talked about education opportunities. And Stuart at the beginning talked about Digital Earth Africa. Um, what Stuart didn't say is that, primarily him, um, we've raised 18 million US dollars. But he and I working together are hopefully going to raise about another 20, 20 million dollars. Uh, and that money is coming um, from DFID in the UK. And one of the suggestions we've made to DFID is that when we do this next phase of capacity development with that money, can we bring youth into that picture? Can we get young geographers, particularly young women, who have an interest in computing science and geography and earth observations and make them part of that. So what I maybe throw out there is maybe with Digital Earth Pacific, we think about doing something similar with the next tranche of money that comes in from that as well. And then on the project sustainability that Tamara talked about, um, she really highlighted the need for people in communities. If I look at how the GEO work program was developed um, and reviewed over the last I don't know, six to, to nine to 12 months, there were many, many people involved in that process. There were a lot of reviews. If you think about 58 implementation plans, people going off and doing reviews, I know some of the people are sitting in the room who've put a lot of effort into that. Um, again, maybe uh, bringing in some more um, youth perspective into some of that and getting some additional ideas on how that's valid for other communities. Another thing we're working on is something called the Geo Knowledge Hub. So the Knowledge Hub is looking at how do we take information that's in disparate sources, particularly things like journals and papers and reproduce. So going from not just open data, but to open science. So looking at reproducibility of all this information. So in the plenary this week, there will be the first presentation of the Geo Knowledge Hub. So if you have something like a unique identifier or a digital object identifier, a DOI, what it will do, it, was, it will be able to provide a link to each of these DOIs, which it could be a scientific journal, it could be a video, it could be a paper, it could be the data, it could be in situ data, and all of that will be in a single place, a single repository. The way that's been developed is we looked at what CERN had done. CERN do the Large Hadron Collider, so they're doing particle <laughs> physics experiments in Geneva. And we looked at, they had a platform called Zenodo, and we built on top of Zenodo, so it's all open source. Anyway, I'm getting too technical, but the, the idea is there's a knowledge hub, and the concept is there to share information. So I have the minute sign, so I'm just going to finish up on what Mark said. Mark said the technical approach is not enough. Um, and here I would say maybe look at the work of the regional geos. So in this region we have Asia Oceania Geo, AOGEO, and capacity development is again a part of the work of AOGEO. So I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to look at that. Um, and then he talked about working with the regional agencies. 
And I think that's something that GEO, as we start to work more with the Pacific region, then we should be spending more time with Micronesia Conservation Trust, with SPC, with SPREP, with these organizations. So I think a lot of them are in the room, which is great. Um, and, I, and I just encourage you to do that. Um, he said about you have to be there for the long term. And I think that, you know, GEO is coming into our 15th year. So I think we've proven that we're, we're here to stick around. So thank you very much. Fantastic. So um, there have been some really good questions coming through from Slido, so I'm just going to pull one up. So to improve scientific literacy in the islands, what works better, sponsoring islanders to study abroad or getting the experts to come and collaborate? And the panel got any questions or views on that? We're all friends here, so be frank and fearless. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I think both. I know that's not a very good answer. It doesn't give you direction. But um, what I can say is right now, more often teams are coming. And, and there are many teams with really, really strong ambition to work with, with people and capacitate people. But as I said, I recognize that a lot of these skills take a lot longer than a one-week training. So we definitely have a lot of people who come and they do um, you know, site-specific or um, um, community science work. But I do think that a, the, a really, the best way is probably for us to invest finances into getting more students into higher level degrees out of the Pacific. MCT, we started um, the Bill Rayner Micronesia Challenge Scholarship. So we ha currently have 12 masters and PhD students from across the region studying all these areas. Um, and we'd be happy if you wanted to contribute to that scholarship. Um, but I think that it's probably, um, it just needed is, is finances. A lot of kids want to do it, but it's very hard because you can't stay in Micronesia and study these things. You have to go abroad. You have to go to UH or you have to go to University of Guam or elsewhere, and it costs a lot of money. So I think that that's it. Yeah. Um, just quickly from a regional agency perspective, uh, I, I also agree that it needs to be a combination, but I would say a targeted combination depending on what the skill is as, as part of the spectrum. So some things you'll want to build capacity at the national level, some things you shouldn't try to build capacity at national level because it's not sustainable. Some fit well in a regional organisation like ours, you want some slightly higher end technical skills there, and then some should always stay outside and we should bring them in where they're too specialised and will never be sustainable. So it depends really at, at what level you're pitching it and as to where it should fit in that eco ecosystem from national through to regional, international. Now, I'm conscious that I haven't made our mic runners do any running, so do we have an audience question for our lovely people with the, the running of the microphones? Are we all so tech savvy that we don't need the old school anymore? Five, four, oh, there we go, we've got one taker over there. <laughs> Gentleman in the black shirt. Just I'll speak up, I think I can have a loud voice, it's an Australian accent, but I live in North Queensland. On that last point about the project, I, I'm, I come from a university, and my biggest success has been running projects, PhD projects, students, in the case I'm thinking of as Papua New Guinea, who did a project in his environment. So the project was, was up in Papua New Guinea. And when he left with his PhD, uh, he's gone back into that community at a quite a high level. And I count that as one of my best successes. So that's one way of doing it. Yep, fantastic. That's something to keep in mind. And of course, if you can. Um, have an inter-country um, partnership at the university level, you create networks of alumni between to the two countries, uh, which can be very powerful too. Um, we might just move on to our next panel. So if you'd like to thank all our panel two members, we'll move on to tech panel three. Um, so the focus here, we've got three great people, um, all coming from slightly different perspectives in the region. Um, and I hope Mr. Puna is coming down. Um, this feels like a contest. Come down and collect your prize. Speaking role, <laughs> plenary. Um, so we have three people here who are um, very much 
working at the interface of using earth obs in situ in the Pacific. Um, we have uh, Mr. Raphael Kagen. Uh, we have my friend um, Noah Puna from the Cook Islands, who's come a long way to be here at Geo Week, and we're so thrilled to have him. And we've got my um, dear mate Indy from the Australian Integrated Marine Observing System, um, who's going to give some perspectives from a in situ perspective, keeping in mind that while you might think of small island states, they're actually large ocean economies. So without further ado, I think I'll throw over to Raphael to say a few words. Thank you, Emma. Uh, Tena Koto, welcome. Uh, so interesting. Uh, part with uh, kicking off this uh, technology panel is that uh, everything has been already said and raised by my fellow panelists in, in previous panels. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, technology suffers a lot, you know, uh, due to the lack of uh, uncoordination if the wrong decisions are made due to the poor governance or, or lack of the vision for sustainability. So let me kick off with, with uh, a story. Uh, of my life. Uh, some 25 years ago, I was a young and uh, naive uh, project manager who thought that I can change the world. Uh, about a week before Christmas, uh, my boss comes to me and says, oh, listen, we have this uh, World Bank sponsored project in one of the small Caribbean islands. Uh, there has been some technical glitch there. Can you go and have a look? Because, you know, it's a week before Christmas, so none of us senior guys are going to do that. So, to, to my surprise, uh, that small Caribbean island turned up to be in Pacific, it was Vanuatu. <laughs> uh, and some 40 hours later, uh, I finally landed in Port Vila. Straight from the airport, completely exhausted, I'm taken to, to Prime Minister office to explain why a multi-million infrastructure has been delivered in container, is sitting on site with no building to install it, with no electricity to run it, with no connectivity, and most importantly, with no people to operate and run that system. And it turned out to be that uh, all the government of Vanuatu has requested was for a simple disaster monitoring support tool. But somewhere the message got converted and by the time it came to the decision makers up in the World Bank and uh, the organization I used to work at the time, the message got completely converted. So ever since then, ever since that story, I made a mission of my life to make sure that uh, such situations never happen in projects that I'm involved with. Have I succeeded? Well, uh, to some extent, and unfortunately, you know, where we are right now uh, is, is I see repetition of the similar challenges over and over again, talking to my fellow uh, colleagues from, from Pacific Islands. So we have still very low understanding of end user needs. We still have very many uncoordinated programs and initiatives run by different countries. It has been all said already so far. Uh, I think you know, we are focusing on the wrong things because you know, uh, we need to solve one issue at a time, uh, look into the basic things, uh, lack of infrastructure, lack of connectivity, lack of uh, technical competence. And uh, yeah, we have all those wonderful platforms and, you know, Sentinel and, and, and data sharing. But, you know, there's one thing. They do not cover Pacific Islands. Uh, and uh, I know some of, of, of my fellow colleagues here have been looking into those issues. This is something we need to look at and we need to address if we want to change it. So trying to be optimistic and, 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 you know, move forward. How do we change that? How do we move and how, how we build this bright future together? Uh, well, we really need to spend uh, the quality time to, to understand end user needs, uh, to uh, make sure that uh, we, we understand what, are the what is the local context, what are the requirements, what are the capabilities there uh, on the ground, and uh, uh, never make assumptions. Because like, like in the story I made, you know, somebody somewhere in Europe made an assumption and it just has been a series of unfortunate events. So never make assumptions, get involved with those local uh, organizations and communities who, who understand what is necessary. And uh, keep it simple, uh, keep it simple, uh, co collaborate, co cooperate and uh, uh, have you know, this end-to-end -end, uh, uh, 
mindset where 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 you know from the very beginning you know uh, you are working towards the certain goals. I think you know I want to wrap up saying that uh, one of the things I've learned uh, at least from that story is that there is no continuity and there is no lessons learned. So you know the project team go back home, they move to another task. There is no any knowledge portal. There is no any any lessons learned exercises never done and. Uh, that's something that I encourage that, you know, uh, we as the part of, of this GEO community work very close together and make sure that uh, we learn from each other. Thank you. Rafael, you timed that almost the second. You had like 13 seconds left. Perfect. Great. Well, we'll, we'll throw over to Mr. Noah Puna now to say a few remarks. Uh, let me connect to our traditional people in my own language and you don't time this this session because it's me connecting to the traditional leaders here iru <clears throat> And the Cook Islands, Kiorana means may you live on. It's one of the, the best greetings you will ever come across. Um, what I was sharing with the traditional um, people of Australia um, is one of our chants where I think it's um, appropriate uh, for the Cook Islands um, and joining in to this GEO um, uh, conference. Uh, it talks about one of the passages that, um, the main passage from the island I grew up in. Um, you don't just uh, go out or come back in to the lagoon. You actually have to, to count. On the ninth wave, the you know, this is our tradition, this is from our ancestors. On the ninth wave, we enter. On the ninth wave, we leave. So I think um, I wanted to use that because it's, it's really timely that I ran into um, Emma Luke uh, of all places, Samoa, for spread meeting. I, was, I had some drinking Australian buddies. You know, they love their beers. I love beers too. So, um, and I went to a side event and these guys were professors from uh, University of Newcastle, you know, um, and then they introduced me to Emma, and here I am. So I think the timing has been perfect for me to be here. You can time now. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. Um, I, I have only been in the, I've been a teacher all my life, a maths teacher. Uh, I've been towards the end of those that 15 years, been a principal of schools. And I'm used to structure, policy, frameworks, I'm used to that. I came into the environmental world um, because my uncle was supposed to have been here. He's the Prime Minister of the Cook Islands. He was also the Minister of Education. He told me, son, I don't want to hire you as the head of Ministry of Education. But um, when I took this role as a the, the minutes, uh, as the director of National Environment Service, I, I, th I knew straight away that I was born for this. I was preparing myself for this job because when I walked into the office first week, I knew that there was a big problem here. We didn't have, we had silos of, you know, we had a whole suite of policy here, policy here, uh, donors did this policy in sanitation. You know, there's a whole lot of things, but there wasn't one thing that we were working from. And for a small place like the Cook Islands, um, 13,000 population, uh, land 240 square kilometer, but big ocean 2 million square kilometer. So you can uh, imagine, it's 15 islands spread across. So we've got so many issues. The issues for, for me at the moment is we are working in silos. Um, 
the marine resources, all of these people, they don't work together. So uh, second week of my, since I started, the second week I, I dedicated Tuesday, 8 to 12 o'clock, and this is just to go through all of the policies, reviewing our act, because it's so weak. In the Cook Islands, maybe it's a Pacific thing. We only react, yeah? And when it comes to environment, you don't see things until it goes really bad, then we react. And I was just blown away just looking at one of the, the pictures outside. That's the sort of thing I want for the Cook Islands, where I can take my politicians, I can take my people back to 1975 and show them the, you know, I, I was just blown away. I had goosebumps just watching the technology that's available out here. But back at home, it's non-existent. Um, we've just graduated as a developed country, so it's a tr we've got a tricky... Yeah, uh, we're not clapping. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tricky situation where, okay, our financial management systems are fine, but we still have problems. The problem is our um, isolation. Okay, we don't have regular shipping to our outer out islands, and all of these things are so real for us. And when we are um, working on projects, we, we don't work beyond what we have, yeah, the budgets we have. And one of the biggest problems that I've shared with some of my Pacific Island friends over a few years last night, and that's um, normally the, the, the donors... Uh, decide what's good for us, or they they want to work on sanitation. I, I I said sanitation before, and that's and that's real for us. But for me, I decided no, I'm not going to take this. I've I've decided that I'm going to do an, an all-encompassing, integrated environment environment policy that future proofs, climate proofs the Cook Islands. We're so small, we're so tiny that we can't afford to make any mistakes. Um, we've got real problems on, on land. We've got sand mining. Um, I, I was sharing about um, the king tides coming in, covering the roads. And um, I, part of the, the projects, they, they were asking for some rocks. So, OK, we said, yes, you can get some rocks. Um, so, but I went, I went out to the rock mining place. We've actually already lost two little mountains. And those people who have been to Rarotonga, it's only a small place. It's only 20 minutes around. And it's so tiny, we can't afford to make any mistakes. So for me, uh, from my education background, I'm looking at ways to actually, um, to actually, <laughs> it, it's actually rude to do that to a Cook Islander, so. <laughs> 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 I, 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 thank you, Jordan. Um, yeah, two more minutes, two more minutes. Um, just for me, the, the opportunity to be part of this um, earth-observing uh, organization is, is going to be huge. It's going to be a, a gigantic leap for us. Um, what the Prime Minister did a few years back was to declare our... Our, our ocean as a marine park. Okay, fine. So they've done all of the big things. Now they've given it to me to, to manage. But how do you manage something you can't measure? Yeah, I'm a teacher by trade. Those educators in the room know that you, know, you need the real things to measure in order for you to manage things. I can't do that, okay? I, I, I can't keep talking. I can't keep saying that, okay, we need to do this. I can't make people aware by not showing them real things. I was just blown away with the technology just out there. And I thought to be part of this movement, there's gonna be some work with uh, Stuart, um, but this, I'm so excited to be here. I'd love to talk for a little bit more, but I, I have been limited by Jordan, so. Um, <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Um, let me, let me, I, I had this, um, I had this little,
quote that I love, and I thought all the speakers before, um, and in relation to myself, the Cook Islanders, being part of this, uh, Doctor Strange, the movie, it says, you cannot beat a river into submission. You have to surrender to its current and use its power as your own. GEO, I'm talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Na. And um, I look forward to having more beer and lots of gin and tonics with you into the future. Um, and uh, we, when we first met over beer and tonics, we um, both said you can't ma manage what you don't measure when we realised there was a connection there. Um, and uh, if you like Mr Puna's uh, work, um, we're very excited that he's going to speak at the GEO plenary under item 2.2. So, you know, I look forward to seeing that talk on Wednesday. So now we're going to um, move along to Indy um, to talk about IMOS and um, the in situ perspective. Thanks, Emma, and um, that was a hard act to follow. Um, so, yeah, my name's Indy. I'm from the Integrated Marine Observing System. We're based down at the University of Tasmania. Um, and, yeah, so we're a sustained ocean observing system, but we're based as a research infrastructure. So our primary focus is delivering data um, from Australia and a bit beyond uh, for research purposes. Uh, it's been around since 2006, it's mainly in situ um, facilities, so we've got 13 facilities, uh, it's 53 sub-facilities, so it's very hard to keep track of. Um, but we've also got a uh, new technology, uh, new technology proving capability as well, because as a um, sustained ocean observing system, we need to make sure that we're integrating new technologies into that system to make it more efficient and effective as well. So that's something new, we've only just started this year. Um, so it's quite timely that Geo Weeks this week. We've just been to Ocean Obs over in Honolulu. Uh, that was very Pacific focused as well. So um, very similar messages as what we've heard today. It's all about making sure you connect with the communities, make sure you've got that societal impact, uh, really making sure that we improve models and forecasting services, and that includes the role of and. Obviously, with um, ocean OBS, it was a lot of in situ data, um, how to make those forecasts. But not just, not just from a scientific perspective and certainly not just from a research perspective, but from an operational perspective to make sure the livelihoods of the people that those models are trying to benefit actually, actually come into fruition. Um, it recognised the uh, critical roles of GEO and GOOSE, the Global Ocean Observing System, and IMOS is one of the GOOSE regional alliances. So uh, that those were designed under um, the Global Ocean Observing System to make sure that there's interaction between the various regions. So in the Pacific, there's um, the Pacific Islands American IU system, so uh, Integrated Ocean Observing System from the US, as well as the Pacific um, Ocean Observing System. So we, we're just a standalone one, but we're going to include New Zealand in that too. We don't want to leave out, leave out our Kiwi neighbours. Um, but again, they were, they were looking for um, the outgoing... It's a decadal conference, the Ocean Obs conference, so the, the um, conference statement was based around uh, how we can contribute to SDGs, Sendai framework, all those sorts of things. So obviously we recognise how important they are. But from an IMOS perspective, uh, we have a very... Um, well, it's developing, but it's a very strong planning for impact uh, strategy. So we always make sure that it's going to be... Whatever we collect in terms of our ocean observing, um, it's very expensive to put infrastructure out. How can we make sure that the data we collect there is actually beneficial to that community, to the scientific community, and make sure those results actually have a societal impact. Um, and that's actually my job. I'm actually not a scientist. I'm an international lawyer by trade. Um, but so what we were talking about with the integration of social sciences um, with Melissa, um, that, that really resonated. So we really want to make sure that whatever we collect is really incredibly important. Um, in terms of... Moving forward, we're, we're looking at new forward strategy, so we want to make sure that we're really in line with what GEO are doing. Um, the messages I was going to talk about today, we've, we've covered. Um, 
But we just want to make sure that our products and our um, data and even our capacity to help is, is part of a conversation with the communities perhaps in the Pacific. And we don't do a lot in the Pacific at the moment, that's why I'm here, is to discuss these sorts of things. Um, we want to have a conversation. Could it be we've got an um, ocean data network, the Australian Ocean Data Network, where we've set up the software for that, that's open source software. I've got, uh, we've got 21 people that work in that particular facility. There's half of them are data scientists, the other half are software developers. Is there something we can leverage out of that that's actually meaningful to the particular communities? The answer to that might not be, it might be no. But what we want to know is what the needs are um, and that's what we really want to understand. Uh, we're just making sure that we're not, we just don't want to have silos of knowledge either. Um, like I said, we do look at the research that uses our data. We're not in direct um, proximity to the research that is done using our data, but we're in control of how we uh, and where we actually um, collect in situ observations. How will that benefit the um, satellite remote sensing all those sorts of things. So basically we're here to um, start a conversation. We want to know what the Pacific Island needs are. And um, yeah, really looking forward to being involved. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Indy. Um, now we'll just uh, ask Stephen to make some remarks. And um, we don't want to keep people from their lunch, and we have got some lunch, so maybe you'll stay to hear out where lunch is. Um, but we'll just hand over to Stephen now, and then myself and David Helwig will provide some final comments. OK. So uh, Raphael talked about... Um, it was quite funny, Raphael. You said you didn't have much to say, and I've got half a page of notes. Um, you talked about lack of coordination with some of this activity, and... It may be specifically in the Pacific region, but I know internationally there's a lot of coordination, and part of the problem is coordinating the coordination. So we have, for example, for open standards in the technology arena, we have the Open Geospatial Consortium, and they work very closely with ISO and with W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. And they come in and they work with GEO from a standards perspective. So we work with those bodies so that we make sure we work with is that that network of networks concept I was talking about before, to make sure we are not duplicating that effort, but we're learning from what they're doing. Um, we, you talked about um, the Caribbean islands. I think that's also something that's quite useful because the Caribbean are now coming into GEO as well, and they're also new, and there are very similar challenges. One of the things that they're working on at the moment is the Caribbean Geospatial Development Initiative. CGDI, and that is being done through the auspices of UNGGIM, so the United Nations Global Geospatial Information Management Committee of Experts. And that was something Rosamond talked about right at the beginning. She talked about the IGIF, which is one of the, the framework activities of UNGGIM as well. So there are a number of these things that I think can be useful for people to learn from and to look at investments that have already been made there. Um, he also talked about Sentinel not covering Pacific. And this is something that has been recognized and has been discussed. And there have been discussions with the European Commission and with others about tasking satellites to do exactly that. So um, there's a couple of people nodding their head. There's Alex Held and Stuart and a few others who are well aware of this and, and have been talking about how do we do this as part of the activities through CEOS and through GEO. So that, that's something that's already being tackled. Um, in terms of like, that, that's quite a, a useful example of how GEO can help the countries to go and ask for things. One of the things GEO did about a decade ago was went to the International Disaster Charter and said, can we get access to the charter during emergencies for GEO members, for GEO member countries, and that's something that was done. So there are a number of these types of things that GEO can do to help the countries as, as a whole. Um, and then you talked about multiple platforms. This is something else that we've recognised, and so through the work we've been doing with the private sector, we have, uh, we started with Amazon Web Services, and what we wanted to do was lower the barrier for entry to technology, and so we asked Amazon for some 
uh, cloud credit. So we got a million and a half dollars from Amazon, which we then distributed across. We ran an open competition and we distributed that across 21 projects. Uh, later this week, we're going to announce uh, a three million grant. I'm not going to say who from yet, but that's going to be one of our announcements. So we put out an open call for the private sector to come back, and they've come back. So we've had many responses from Europe, from North America, and from Asia for private sector to come in and help GEO to do this. Um, I met Nga um, yesterday, and it took me half an hour to pronounce his name, so I'm going to call him Mr. Puna. Um, Mr. Puna, um, I think it's great that he's a teacher, because one of the things I always talk when I go to meet ministers or when I go to meet director generals or people who don't know that much about GEO, I talk about the four C's in GEO, which are essentially my job. So the first one's communications. And we're pretty rubbish at it as a community because quite a lot of it is just science. And trying to translate that science and technology into policy and action is really, really tough. So communications is one of those C's. Capacity development is another one. Um, collaboration is another one, and commercial sector is the fourth one. So th those four C's are, are, are what, what I talk about. And he talked a lot about you know, communications and awareness raising. And I think having people who have come in, especially from the social sciences side, who can help us do that is really, really helpful. Um, he talked about people working in silos. And this is, again, fr from an Earth observations perspective, something we've, we've seen a lot. And in many countries, there are national geos. So here you have Australia geo, you have China geo, Colombia geo, UK geo. You have all these different geo entities where many agencies get together and work on what are the challenges where Earth observations can help. So I don't know if there's going to be Pacific geo, but it's an opportunity to help break down some of those silos. Um, and it's also, he talked about, you know, isolation in small size. I think, again, that's where you can, you can benefit and learn from the community and, and gain support and resources. I mean, India effectively made an offer to help with science and technology for MD that's interested for the ocean work that they're doing. So I think that's a good example of how GEO offers that kind of convening area. So India talked about research in infrastructures. Again, there are numerous of these across GEO uh, globally. One of the things we're working on that might be interesting to people is with the Belmont Forum. So looking at how can we put together funding programs for research infrastructures. Um, and we're looking at how we can do something collaboratively with them next year. Um, Indy talked a lot about in situ. Um, and they, that has an increased focus across geo in the work program, not just from an oceans perspective, but also in areas such as agriculture and biodiversity. And I mentioned the Knowledge Hub, and the in situ part of that is also very important, um, to the point that we've actually hired someone full time as an in situ officer. So we have someone there now to coordinate the in situ data management. Um, I, in, uh, Indy talked about we're here to start a conversation. So, so you're all he hopefully here for several days or the whole week, and that's what we want to do. We want to get everyone talking together. Um, but I just want to finish on what. Uh, Mr. Puna said that, you know, hopefully if you all engage in GEO, then it will be a gigantic leap for everyone who participates. And uh, enjoy, enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you. Fantastic. So I'm just going to take one question, I think, from the audience, um, because then we're going to talk about what's next. So this one is for Mr. Puna. Um, and I've just lost Slido. Um, okay, so from Anonymous. Who do you currently have on speed dial outside of Rarotonga that you can call for advice, technology and data support, and why? Check. Um, no one at the moment, just Emma. <laughs> I'm not the most helpful person in the room, you know, <laughs> but I'll try. <laughs> well, well, uh, I think uh, also what's advantageous for us is I've had a little chat with uh, Stuart because Stuart now moves across uh, to SPC next year and the, the Prime Minister will be his uh, boss for a little bit. So um, uh, 
yeah, I'm again using the power of the river, that current to, uh, to take us. Yeah, thank you. So your mission this week is to give out all of your business cards. <laughs> um, okay, do we have an audience question or a comment? Nope. All right, well, we might... Um, oh, sorry. No. We might just quickly wrap this up. Um, so I was going to offer some closing remarks, but two things on that. One, uh, Stephen Ramage has done such a fabulous job of wrapping up um, the conversation for each panel. So I think we give him a clap for that. <laughs> and the second thing is, I'm going to say, we're not having closing remarks, we're having opening remarks, because this has opened a great discussion that we're going to continue through the week through our Pacific Island program. So we have a number of events this week. Um, there, are some, there are some information, some handouts at the top, so please take them um, to find out what's happening um, over the course of the week. Of course, the Talanoa Tuesday is a big one tomorrow, so we expect to see lots of you, if not all of you, there. Um, now, in terms of today, um, you're in luck. We've actually got some lunch for you guys upstairs outside of the Pacific Island room. So feel free to come up with us and join the conversation over a sandwich and a glass of um, juice. Um, and we then have uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. David Helwig, who will be running um, the deep dive um, session. Um, and he's going to talk to you in just one moment about that. Um, the two other remarks I will say is all of the programs and agendas for the week are now on the website, so check it out. And if you haven't already, please download Attendify. It's the best way that we're actually keeping you abreast of everything that's happening across Geo Week. So now I'd like to hand over to Dave. Thank you, Emma. I'm acutely aware that I'm between you and lunch. Uh, I, I, I'm from the big island of Hawaii, so I, I say to you, aloha mai kako. Um, I would like to uh, give my, my sincere appreciation to the executive committee for their uh, uh, tremendous support in, in transitioning from one key side event this morning to a multi-day Pacific Island program. So thank you very much. Um, after we uh, eat, and perhaps while we're still uh, eating our lunch, we'll begin our deep dive stories from the Pacific session up in the executive room, uh, just up the stairs and off to the right. Um, we have a set of seven speakers who will give us some in-depth uh, perspectives on applications of EO uh, in local context, and there will be some time for questions. And so I, uh, again, to, to echo um, Emma's uh, invitation, please come up and join us for lunch, and uh, we hope to see you in the deep dive at 1.30. Thank you. So, once again, I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of Laura and Jordan and a few of the others who have helped bring this all together. It's a lot of work. Um, so, please thank them. They've worked very tirelessly. Um, and thank you for the panels. And see you upstairs. Thank <laughs> you.